lecture for today, desert ecosystems. So we're going to take a look at deserts and rain showers. So there's a couple things that uh, we'll point out that will be important in this lecture and things that you'll have to know for the final exam. So what is a desert? Uh, by definition, a desert is an area that receives or has greater evaporation. That means water leaving than precipitation water coming in. So it's kind of a negative budget. More water leaves the desert than comes in. So we might say, well, how does this desert sustain itself? Well, one of the uh, parts of the desert that's unique is that there are underground water systems, aquifers, that come up in the form of springs in some places. And so deserts, the water that was put in these environments was put in place about, at the end of the last glaciation, about 12,000 years ago. So the water basins that we see in desert environments are very fragile systems. And municipalities like San Diego want to go out to those areas and extract that water. And essentially what they're doing is they're taking away fossil water. Water is very old. So greater evaporation than precipitations. And normal deserts, or what we call natural deserts, are generally found at 30 degrees north and south latitude. Now that is without the interference of mountain ranges. Because mountain ranges, as we're going to find out, can create deserts that lie outside of this 30 degree north and south latitude. So mountain ranges can actually create what's called a rain shadow. They actually block the rain. A good example of that in our part of the world is Nevada. Las Vegas, a good part of Nevada, is a rain shadow desert. It's a little too north to be a true desert. It's part of the Great Basin Desert. And it's there because California Sierra Nevada mountains block that precipitation from going into Nevada. So it also be formed as a rain shell. This is how deserts occur. So deserts are kind of unique ecosystems. They have developed a rather unique system. They have very poorly developed soils. The plants go back to the early part of the Cenozoic when Pangaea broke apart and climate became a little more diverse. We have what we call um, non-vascular plants actually subdivided into succulents these are plants that can absorb a lot of water in a short period of time and store it for a long time, which allows them to go for long periods of time without any precipitation or any water. Desert environments have very poorly developed soils due to the lack of precipitation. There's also a survival mode that takes place. This is a bush called creosote. And creosote bushes actually space themselves apart. Another bush cannot grow next to it. It actually extracts a poison that keeps another creosote bush from growing next to it. And the interesting thing about deserts is because the air is so dry, the temperatures can vary. So in the daytime, very warm, and the nighttime, pretty cool. So you see this huge fluctuation of temperature. And that's primarily due to the insufficient amount of water vapor in the atmosphere of deserts. So desert climates, their ambient air tends to be very dry. So sand dunes are a good part. So you have so deserts are pretty spread out. What we call a desert and what people have in their mind as a desert varies. Uh, when some people think of a desert, they think of the Sahara Desert, these big sand dunes, rolling sand dunes wherever. Other, other people may think of cacti or large saguaro cactus. And so you have to realize that some of these desert environments are very fragile. And the desert ecosystems in the southwest United States deserts has more biodiversity. So what is biodiversity? If you take all of the species, the genera, and you look at the genetic information, deserts have more biodiversity than the rainforest. Because the rainforest is all rainforest. It's all the same ecosystem. But as you move up mountains, you go from very dry areas up to pinyon pine trees. Big Bear is a good example of that. You leave the valleys, San Bernardino, and as you go up the mountain, it gets cooler, and you see a complete different change of vegetation. You see pine trees that grow there naturally. So these plants have adaptations. They've adapted to, through natural selection, to meet environmental pressures. Those environmental pressures have adapted these plants to store water, to live in very poorly developed soil conditions. I mean, you take most plants and you stick them in the desert and they'll die. Even if you give them water, 
There's just inadequate soil and inadequate nutrients. A lot of plants don't have a way to extract those nutrients out of uh, rock the way cacti do. So some deserts are very sandy where nothing grows. Other deserts tend to be very well populated. And as it turns out, most deserts are found in latitudes 30 degrees north and south of the equator. And deserts vary. So in the western United States, we have the Great Basin Desert, which is northern Nevada, northern Utah. We have the Mojave Desert, which is Barstow, Palm Springs. We have the Sonoran Desert, which is southern Arizona. And then we have the Chihuahuan Desert, where part of it sneaks into the very southern part of Arizona and California. So deserts are named, the reason we have these different deserts in the western United States is because the plant species make those deserts unique. A good example is the Sorora cactus is an indicator species for the Sonoran Desert. You don't find Sorora cactus growing in the Mojave Desert or the Great Basin Desert. So these deserts have their own identity, so their own little ecosystems. So this is a map showing the natural desert. So the Sahara Desert is a good example of a natural desert. It rides right there in that equatorial plain between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. So here's the equator right here. So 30 degrees north of the equator or 30 degrees south of the equator, these are the areas that we find deserts. But now we find the desert like the Gobi Desert. It's a little bit out of place. It should be down here in India, but instead it's up into the China and Asia instead of India. The reason India is not a desert is because the Himalayan mountain ranges right here, they take the warm Pacific, the warm water that comes off the Pacific, comes into the Indian Ocean, that warm water, then as it goes up the mountain, it cools, it condenses, it forms rain, and that rain falls on the, this side of the Himalayas. On the opposite side, that air is dry, and this is why we have the Gobi Desert. The same is true for the Great Basin Desert of the Western United States. So the Sierra Nevada Mountains block that rain. So the Great Basin Desert, the Mojave Desert, are really, truly, just a little bit too north to be true deserts that fit that profile of 30 degrees north and south latitude. The driest desert in the world, Patagonian Desert, the driest has gone the longest period without any rainfall. Decades without rain. Imagine that. So desert plants have thick leaves. They have very, some of them don't have leaves at all. So the swore cactus has no leaves. The trunk of the plant is green. That produces chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is then used for photosynthesis. So you take sunlight, which is photosynthesized, with the green spectrum, that photosynthetic material is the energy that is used to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere along with water to produce sugar. The carbon is retained within the plant and the plant exhales oxygen. And so this is basically all common law photosynthetic plants. But desert plants are unique in the sense that they don't have a leaf structure to do that photosynthesis. That is actually done in the trunk or the stems of the plant itself. There are some desert plants that do have leaf structures, but they're very small. And the stromata, which exerts water outward, they use water to cool themselves off, just like humans sweat. Plants do the same thing. And then in that process, they expel oxygen and water vapor to the atmosphere but their stromata are very small. So there's a variety of cacti, prickly pear. Again, this really isn't what you call a leafy plant. It has no leaf whatsoever. The green color, though, that allows photosynthesis to occur. You have dragon trees. You have uh, Joshua trees. You have trees that, uh, plants that are very unique, that grow only in desert environments. This is a unique plant. It has a white flower to it. And so flowers generally want to attract pollinators like bees, right? So why would you be white? Butterflies, uh, bees are going to be attracted to very bright yellow, pink, 
morning flowers. These are pollinated at night by bats. This plant has adapted itself. It does not open its flower during the day because if it did, it would dry out too hot. So it waits till the evening, opens its flower, and it's pollinated by bats. So this adaptation, so this is part of the whole Charles Darwin hypothesis that plants and animals can adapt themselves to environmental pressures and to adapt to a particular environmental pressure and become adapted to that environment. And so Ocotillo is a good example of that. When there's sufficient rainfall, Ocotillo are these little stringers that come out with thorns on them. When there's sufficient rainfall, they grow a leaf. And that leaf is their whole process to produce sugar and food for the plant through photosynthesis. Now, during dry years or dry periods of the year, insufficient water, that plant will actually drop its leaves. And so this is the way that that plant is adapted to conserve water. Because if you have too many leaves out there, those leaves are going to take water out of the plant and put it into the atmosphere. So the plant's going to lose water through those leaves. So Ocotillo is a really good example that has allowed the plant to lose its leaves. And then other desert plants that keep their leaves throughout the year have very small stromata, or very few stromata. So stromata are basically almost like the pores that allow water to escape the plant. So plants have to extrude some water. They use it basically as a way to cool themselves down, just like we sweat. That's how we cool our bodies down. If you did not sweat, you would get heat stroke. And plants, same thing, they would actually die. So different plants have adapted to different environments. You have Ocotillo, Joshua trees, which are referred to as cactus, are not really trees at all. They're not cactus at all, they're actually a tree. They have very thick leaves, but very thin. The yucca will bloom at, in the evening hours, but not during the daytime. Aloe vera plants will send up uh, blooms in the springtime, and then the rest of the year they don't have those little flower blooms. And so we have a whole bunch of environment parameters that allow these cacti to adapt. As it turns out, Joshua trees can only grow at upper elevations. You won't find Joshua trees in low deserts like in Death Valley. You have to go up into higher elevations, up, up above about 3,000 feet before you start seeing Joshua trees. During the springtime, the deserts can be very beautiful. They get an ample rainfall, flowers can bloom, but then when that rain goes away, dissipates off, and temperatures start to rise, these flowers will turn into basically dead plants real quickly. Sora cactus, unique in itself, produces these little flowers, they're pollinated. These little pods are going to drop off, they have seeds in them. As these pods roll away or they get consumed by animals, taken away by, by pack rats, the seeds are then dispersed and they grow new sora cactus. During the spring, and this was a good year for this, by the way, a lot of flowers are blooming this year. This is actually down in Arizona, a place called Picacho Peak. And this is what the desert can look like for a very short period of time. Depending on what part of the desert you're at and the elevation, somewhere between March and mid to late April, the desert can be very beautiful. A lot of blooms like this. Here's another scene, and now as the rainfall starts to leave the area. Rain, no, no, no more thunderstorms come in. Temperatures start to rise and the flowers start to whittle away a little bit. It starts to get a little bit more brown. And then when May comes along and the temperature goes up to 90 degrees and then June with 100 degrees and then in the desert it gets 110, 115 degrees well, to July and August. Not a really good environment for flowering plants to develop, and so the result is that these plants die, they'll drop their seeds, they'll wait for the next rainfall event to occur in the wintertime, and the following spring, if there's sufficient water, there could be a pretty bloom again. And this bloom kind of varies from year to year. There have been years when we receive a significant amount of rainfall, and we did this year. There was a fair amount of rainfall that, so it's kind of strange California, 
it seemed like our February was kind of like our April, and our March was like our January or December. So you had a lot of late rain, and that resulted in really good, significant bloom for the deserts this year. There are some cacti that basically do not depend on sporadic water. They can absorb water and keep the water within them. They have very protective, very thorny material to, to basically to protect themselves. And so these plants have adapt themselves very well to desert environments. Swore cactus. By the time one of these cacti get one arm, they have to be 75 years old. So imagine that. So these are cacti that live very long. They are very important for the ecosystem. They're indicative species for the storm desert. They live in deserts that don't freeze. So if the climate were to change and it were to get colder, say around Phoenix, Arizona, these swore cactus would die. So we only find swore cactus in deserts where it doesn't freeze, and that's an indicator plant for the storm desert. So the storm desert does not freeze. The Mojave Desert and the Great Basin Desert do freeze, and the swore cactus would never survive there. A lot of plants and also a lot of animals that have adapted themselves to these desert environments. A lot of the species come out at night and they hide during the daytime. So a lot of reptilian creatures, what we, so what, we, what people refer to as cold-blooded, even though they're blood releasing cold, they're basically species that have to, regul have to regulate their body temperature by going in the sun. They receive too much solar radiation and go back in the shade cool down for a while. And so deserts are the home of many living organisms. Deserts with a variety of plants and animal species have greater biodiversity than the rainforest. So there's more biodiversity in the deserts than there is in the rainforest. And a lot of people consider deserts as wastelands. A lot of interesting bugs and species that appear. So a desert tortoise right now is a tortoise that is threatened and endangered because of development and human encroachment. So humans like to build right in the prime habitat of desert tortoises. Also, large solar farms that are being built in the deserts are being built right at critical habitat for desert tortoises. Scorpions, though, they've adapted to the environment of humans. They have basically infested people's homes in places like Phoenix, Barstow, Palm Springs, Las Vegas. There's almost an infestation. People actually walk around their homes with the black lights because these scorpions fluoresce a bright green. And they'll crawl in your shoes. So that's a good example of a species that adapted itself to human involvement. And then a horned lizard, which people all refer to as the horny toad. It's not a toad at all. It's a lizard. It has some horns on the back of its head. It's a lizard that buries itself in the sand. It has a very long sticky tongue and eats ants. And then owls have adapted by burrowing into a swara cactus. And so some of these animals have body parts that help them adapt to these very arid environments. They tend to be light colored, so they're blended with the light colored sand and the rock. And they'll have keen hearing and senses of smell that are different than species living in rainforest. Some of the species are nocturnal. They'll come up only at night. So they sleep during the day, they come up at night. A good example of that is the Gila monster. This is the only poisonous lizard in the Western United States. It is yellow or orange and black in color. And whenever you see red and black, yellow and black, those color combinations generally is an indicator that species is poisonous or has some type of venom to it. So bees are an example of that. And the Gila monster actually has enough poison. And this is its defense. It bites you and it will kill a full-grown human being. They're also a threatened species. So deserts have ecosystems where you have the primary producers, which are the plants. You have the primary consumers, the insects. 
and the lizards are going to then eat the insects, and you have the secondary um, carnivores, and then at the very top, the large predators, the hawks, the kid foxes, and so we have a whole hierarchy, ecosystem, much just like in any other ecosystem. So deserts are basically very similar to other ecosystems. They've just adapted to live in a little bit more harsher environments. So here's a kit fox. These are mostly nocturnal. They sleep during the day, they come out at night, and they hunt rabbits. Bighorn sheep, very top of the food chain. They occupy very high mountains. They'll come down into basins during the winter. So in the summertime, they go up in the higher mountains. During the uh, wintertime, they'll come down into the basins. So they kind of move around and search for food. And then, of course, there's the scorpion. And there's many varieties of these scorpions. And they have adapted very well to humans building in their environment. They just move right into your house. They're perfectly fine there. Snakes, probably the most um, feared thing of deserts, like go in the desert, watch out for the rattlesnake, right? Um, most snakes are afraid of you, and they will actually flee. The, although there is a very aggressive snake in the Mojave Desert called the Mojave Green. It's basically a Russian diamondback that's got a green collar. Most snakes, when they bite you, they either affect your respiratory system or your nervous system. The Mojave Green affects both. Very lethal. In fact, people who work in the desert and like for the railroad actually carry EpiPens. And if they're bit by that snake, they have to immediately inject themselves because there's just not enough time to get to a hospital. A lot of reptiles. And the reptiles in the desert are really cool. I mean, they just, they've adapted so well to the environment. Very light colored. Very adapted to the environment. There's some geckos. In some places in the desert where there's a sufficient moisture, there are a variety of geckos. And then now let's look at rain shell deserts. So I want you to understand the parts of rain shell deserts. I kind of drew this out here. I'll kind of wheel this so you can see it. Rather than move the camera, I'm just going to move the board. So this is a rain shell desert. And I'm going to make sure that um, the camera is in view. Okay, cool. Is this working? All right, so the way a rain shuttle works is this is the mountain range. So this is my mountain. So here's the mountain. The way rain shadow deserts work is there's two sides of a mountain range. There's the windward side, that's the way the wind blows, and there's the leeward side, that's the, on the back side of the wind pattern. So as the wind blows, it's going to bring warm, moist air. That warm, moist air as it travels up the mountain, the temperature is going to drop. So we can see this if you ever drive to Big Bear. So let's say you went to Big Bear during the summer when it's warm, say it's 90 degrees and you drive out the Big Bear, it's cooler up there. So every, when you see an increase in elevation, the temperature drops. That's why Big Bear receives snow in the wintertime, and we do not in Orange County. So as that air mass goes up, the higher the elevation, the cooler the air mass. As it turns out, warm air can hold more moisture than cool air. So warm air holds a lot more moisture than cool air. So if you take warm air with 90% humidity, as that warm air rises and becomes cooler, it can't hold the moisture anymore. So what's it going to do? It's going to form clouds. And if those clouds become dense enough with moisture, they'll lose that moisture in the form of rain. If the elevation is high enough, then that rain is going to turn to snow. So on the windward side of the mountain, you can see a lot more rain and snow. Now, as that warm air mass rose, it cooled, condensed from clouds. So these are actually the clouds. These are kind of like the clouds you see on The Simpsons. 
And then as that air mass now goes down on the leeward side, as that air mass goes down with each thousand degree of elevation, it drops, it's going to warm. And warm air tends to be drier. So that air has lost all this moisture up here in the form of rain and snow. So by the time that air mass goes on the leeward side, the back side of the mountain range, the air is basically void of moisture or very low moisture content. And this is why dry, warm, dry, and this is where you find deserts. So this is what's called a rain shadow desert. And I'll go a little more into detail here. And I just so on exam, on our final exam, I definitely want you to know the parts of a rain shallow desert. So rain shallow desert. Make sure that the camera didn't move and that we can see everything good. Didn't it? Didn't it? No. Yes, we're good. Okay, so rain shallow deserts. So this is a very crude drawing, same thing I kind of had on the dry erase board. Prevailing winds, in this case the winds are going from across this way. So as that air mass takes its moisture up, for every thousand of feet that it goes up in elevation, it drops in temperature between three to five degrees. Cooler air holds less moisture than warm air. So as this warm air starts to cool, it can hold less moisture. That moisture is then going to form clouds. It's going to rain on the lower elevations of the mountain, snow at the upper elevations. As the air mass now travels onto the leeward side, that air mass is going to warm. It's going to dry, and on the back side of these mountains is where we see deserts. And that's a typical scene. So just to give you an example of where this occurs, the Andes mountain ranges, basically, is what we call a rain shell desert. So the prevailing winds are these the trade winds. The winds come across the Pacific Ocean. They rise up the Andes mountains. They drop all their moisture in the form of snow and rain in the Andes mountains. And when that wind goes on the back side, it creates the driest desert in the world, the Patagonian Desert. Now, it's a good thing that um, in northern Brazil, in the northern part of uh, South America, that the prevailing winds come off of the Atlantic Ocean. And here, those, those winds go up the Andes, and all that rain is dropped into this area here, the, the, the basin which is basically the Amazon Basin, which created the Amazon rainforest. But as that wind goes down on the liquid side, it creates a desert over here, the Anaconda Desert. The same thing happens in Hawaii. So it's hard to imagine Hawaii, a tropical place that's going to have a desert. But it does. There's a very wet side of the islands and a very dry side, especially the big island of Hawaii. So as it turns out, on the north end of the Hawaiian Islands, this is very tropical. A lot of tropical plants, a lot of greenery. And on the opposite side, on the south side of the Hawaiian Islands, it's a desert. They have grasslands, and those grasslands are adequate to, to basically have large cattle ranches. And when you go there and you visit, it's like I was, I was amazed. I was there, and it's just like, this looks like a picture of Montana, Wyoming. Wide open grasslands with cows munching away on the grasslands. So yeah, even Hawaii, tropical islands like Hawaii, they can have a rain shallow effect because of the wind directions. And so there's another drawing showing that basically north side of the island, very wet. The south side of the island, very dry. Basically a rain shallow. And so when you look at the opposite side, so here, Mount Kilauea, snow on it in the wintertime. And then on the back side of it are these grasslands where there's big cattle ranches. We see rain shallow deserts, certainly the Great Basin Desert of all Nevada and Utah, which gets, goes up into Oregon and Idaho. The Sierra Nevada Mountains take the prevailing winds that come off the Pacific Ocean as that air mass goes up, cools, snow falls on the Sierra Nevada Mountain, which is good for us. Uh, bad for Nevada because they're a desert. So that's a good example of a rain shallow desert. Also the Mojave Desert, because of the San Bernardino, San Gabriel Mountains, they block that precipitation. The Sonoran Desert here and the Chihuahua Deserts are pretty much natural deserts. 
they're at that 30 degrees boundary, so they're kind of more like natural deserts. And so elevation and biodiversity. So when I said that deserts have more biodiversity than the rainforest, it's because of this elevation. So typically what we see in the deserts of the southwestern United States is we see mountain ranges. You go to a basin, another mountain range, down another basin again, another mountain range. So as you increase in elevation, you see a different community of plants. Different plants are going to attract different animals. And so deserts have more biodiversity because each increase in elevation results in plant communities that adapt to the conditions of that elevation and that temperature and that water content. So animal species also differ due to the changes in plant species. So a lot of animals are adapted to plants. It's very rare that you see the opposite. So animals adapt themselves to the plants in that area because that's their primary source of food. So this is a good example, this is Death Valley. Death Valley is actually below sea level. There's nothing growing out here. Hot pavement, it's 115 degrees. I think the highest temperature in Death Valley recorded was 125 degrees. Very hot. And then look at the Telescope Mountain Range. So here you go from minus sea level to almost 9,800 9, feet above sea level. It's common to see snow up there. There's pine trees growing up here, and down here there's nothing growing. So this is a good example of where you have a huge change in a very short distance of ecosystems. And so as you go up these mountains, you see this huge change. So this is actually the dry lake, the playa. Nothing's growing out here. This is what I would call a true desert, right? Nobody can survive up there because there's nothing to survive off of. And then as you go up in elevation, you'll start to see more plants. So get out of the dry pan area, you'll see the yuccas. Then you'll just start to see larger plants in a little higher elevations. Then you'll start to see a mix of succulents and bushes, and then some trees, like a Palo Verde tree here. Go to a little higher elevation, you see Joshua trees. This is typically what we see a Joshua tree. Joshua trees are pretty high elevation desert. Go a little higher, you start to see junipers. And then as you go up, you start to see more and more plants. So the plants that are living up on this ridge are different than the plants that are living down here. And this is why deserts have so much biodiversity. Just in this picture here, these are granitic mountains, these are volcanic. So you see different rock types, different plants, different elevations, and this is why deserts have so much biodiversity to them. As you go to the very top of the deserts, you start to see, the very top of the mountains, I should say, you'll see trees like ponderosa and pine. And so here's a good example of, this is actually up in Redwood, looking down at Lancaster. Desert environment down there, not a desert here, in a very short distance. And it's because of the changes in elevation, this is why deserts have such dramatic ecosystems. And this is why there's more biodiversity in a desert than there is in a rainforest. So let's look at next to oasis. So oasis are kind of neat things. This is water in a desert ecosystem that's out of place. And they occur due to groundwater surfacing, and it's generally due to a geological event, such as a geological fault or maybe a change in rock type. And so you've got to change the rock layers. And because this water is under pressure often, it'll result in what we call an artesian or a spring or a well. So where do oasis occur? Well, they occur in deserts like this. Uh, this is what you would expect. And this is actually in the Sahara Desert. This is where water emerges along a geological fault. So when the water hits that fault, it emerges up along that fault. A place that can be seen very well is Palm Springs. Palm Springs is built right on top of a major fault system. It's a sub-branch of the San Andreas Fault. They call it the Palm Springs Fault, even though it really is a branch of the San Andreas. So Palm Springs was discovered because there was water coming out of the ground. 
People going across the desert, they need water. Wow, there's water here. So they settled that. They didn't know that they were actually settling on top of a major geological fault. They settled there because there was water. As it turns out, if you look at a lot of the cities, when the pioneers came across, they found water. Like, hmm, there's water here. I wonder why. Well, look at all these little water wells are kind of like in a straight little line. And yeah, San Andreas Fault. So the reason people part, went to Parkville because there were springs there. Fraser Park was formed because of springs. Palm Springs, definitely. Palmdale. So these springs were emerging along the San Andreas Fault. So Palm Springs sits right on the San Andreas Fault. And so this is actually Palm Springs. This is the Palm Springs Canyon Fault. It's the Banning Mission Fault. And of course the San Andreas Fault's out here. A whole host of faults. And the way this works is I think I'll draw a picture of this on the dry erase board here. I think this will work best. I'll be in here just a second. I'm going to erase the Ray Channel Desert. Not much nicer doing videos inside the, inside the classroom here. You have a lot more opportunity to do things and make things late, make a little more continuity and sense. I'm just going to make sure that my screen and my projector and everything are centered. So, okay, cool. So there's a mountain range called the San Jacinto Mountains. This winter, the San Jacinto Mountains got a lot of snow on it. And they've kind of come down into the Palm Desert. So this would be Palm Springs. So Palm Springs sits right on faults, like the San Andreas Fault systems out here. And so what occurs up in the higher elevations of the San Jacinto Mountains is we have snow. And in the lower, uh, lower elevations, we'll have rain. So what happens is that snow melts. It's going to infiltrate into the ground, and it's going to go travel through the rock. So there's water's going to travel through the rock. And when it goes out of the basin down here in the Palm Springs, it hits the San Andreas Fault, or the Palm Springs Fault, or Banning Fault. And then that water is forced upward and surfaces as a spring. And that's why Palm Springs is there, because it's built right on top of the San Andreas Fault System. And the water is there because you have to realize that out here in the Imperial Valley in Palm Springs, this is pretty close to sea level. This is like zero degrees. In fact, there's parts of the Salton Sea that are below sea level. And I think the elevation of San Francisco Mountains is like 8,900 feet. So you have a dramatic change in elevation. So you, you have this huge elevational change from 8,900 feet down to zero. And so huge elevation change in a short linear distance, big elevation change, a lot of gradient, a lot of pressure forcing this water downward along gravity. And when this water under pressure hits that fault, it comes up along the fault in the former spring. And that's basically how Palm Springs was formed. Natural artesian wells. Uh, they disappeared because as more and more people moved into the area, there was an increase in demand for water. So instead of relying on the springs, they started drilling, removing groundwater, which lowered the water table, and the springs dried up. So the springs are no longer there. So it's not really Palm Springs anymore. It's Palm Wells, really. So you can take this little tramway up, which is pretty cool. You ride this tramway all the way up to the top of the mountains. You can see this huge biodiversity that occurs because you're going from a desert to forest. And down below is the Palm Desert, right along the San Andreas Fault. So this is the San Jacinto Mountains. They get snow. 
and then that snow is going to melt, it's going to percolate, it's going to absorb into the ground, it's going to travel its groundwater, and then when it hits the fall, it emerges. So the reason they call it Palm Springs, obviously palm trees, the California fan palm was there, along with the water, and that's why Palm Springs was settled, because it was a good place for water, and right along the mountains, very pictures, very pretty, nice dry climate. They started building a bunch of little golf courses there, so people could chase little white balls around and stick them in these little holes, right? And so as they built more and more golf courses, the increase in demand for water resulted in the lowering of the water table, and the original springs have dried up. They're gone. Kind of a sad impact that humans have, but that's just the way we are. We like to change things around. So that's the end of deserts. So they are fragile ecosystems, and I hope you enjoy deserts a little bit more, or have a little bit more of an appreciation for them. That's all for now.